Okay. Uh, so today we are going to study about an economic model of production. And in the process, we are also going to study some uh, bits and pieces of theoretical nuggets uh, in so far as positive matrices are concerned. So this is not positive definite matrices that we have discussed earlier, rather positive matrices, by which I mean that every entry of the matrix is going to be strictly greater than zero. There's also a theory of non-negative matrices. So all this embodies a very rich domain, which is known as the peron Frobenius theory, okay? We shall not have the time to really delve deep into and do justice to this entire topic of peron Frobenius theory. That in itself can constitute a long course. Uh, so we shall only touch upon certain aspects of positive matrices. And if you're interested, I urge you to go through similar results that exist for non-negative matrices as well. And you might think, well, positive matrices seems like an artificially constructed matrix after all. In which application do you find positive matrices? But there are, in fact, a lot of applications of positive matrices. In fact, many of the day-to-day -day applications that we see admit positive numbers. So the example that I have in mind is the so-called Leon TF's model. Okay. So it says that, suppose you have a certain number of industries, <clears throat> say n number of industries, okay? They each manufacture a different kind of product, all right? But this is a very closely knit uh, group of industries in the sense that every industry needs the output of every other industry, including itself, to manufacture its own product. See where I'm going with this? It's like industry one cannot manage to get its product made if any of the other industries shut shop. Every single unit that industry one manufactures relies on the output of every other industry, including its own. You might say, where did it get its first product from? Well, that is a question we will not get into. So the same holds for every industry. Now, this gives rise to a certain matrix of the following form. So it will be an n by n matrix. <clears throat> so this every column corresponds to, I'll explain shortly what it corresponds to. So every column of this matrix tells me exactly how many units of the other industry's product is needed to manufacture one unit of that given industry. By that same token, what I mean is, this is L11, L21, LN1. Similarly, this is L12, this is L22, LN2. And by the same token, this last one would be L1N, L2N to LNN. Which means that industry one, in order to manufacture one unit of its output, it requires L11 units of itself, L21 units of industry two. So I might as well create an array like this until it requires LN1 units of industry N, right? So if you gather together these many units of the first industry, these many units of the second industry, so on and so forth, until these many units of the last industry, and you combine them together, you can manufacture one unit of industry one's product. Is that clear? That's the description. That's what this uh, data, that's the data encapsulated by this matrix. Right. The explanation is clear, what this means. Yeah. Similarly, industry two requires L12 units of industry one's output, L22 units of its own output, so on till LN2 units of industry N's output to manufacture one unit of its own product. So this is the basic description. All right. Now, there's also another thing called profitable. So when is an industry said to be profitable? Very loosely speaking, if you are manufacturing 
more than you are consuming, then you are said to be profitable. So very loose description would be, if the sum of these columns for any one column, if the column sum is less than unity, then that industry corresponds to a profitable industry. Why do I say that? It means that industry one gobbles up a total of less than one unit from every other industry including itself in order to manufacture one unit of its output. Right? So in the language of this matrix, if L i, where i is the ith column of, yeah, this is ith column of L has a column sum less than unity, then the ith industry is said to be profitable. Right? Now, if this system has to run in a, in, a, in a closed environment, in a closed setting, what do you think is the equilibrium setting for such a system? So that no, none of the industries shut shop, they all keep running forever without ever having any crisis. At the same time, they are not profligate, which is to say wasteful. Sorry? Column sum zero, can it be? All column sums equal to? One. Then what would happen? So very intuitively you think that, that is when they will keep, keep manufacturing till eternity. But we should be able to translate that in linear algebraic parlance. Yeah. So what are we trying to look for then? How many units must each industry manufacture to just about have sufficient for itself as well as for the others? So suppose each industry's manufacturing uh, capacity is given by this vector x1, x2 till xn, right? Then what are we essentially asking for? x1 units must equal what exactly? If I2 manufactures x2 units, then how many of x1 units must it consume? L12 times x2. If In manufactures xn units, how many units of x1 must it consume? L1n times xn. So if I sum together like this, L11x1 plus L12x2 plus so on till L1n xn, must it not equal x1? Yeah. So if I may use the term sort of break even, even though it has a different connotation in uh, finance, but to just cater to everybody, the condition needed is So the required condition is this, <coughs> x1 must be equal to summation L1j xj, x2 must be equal to summation L2j xj until xn must be equal to summation Lnj xj, which does it not translate to Lx is equal to x, right? Now just recall the description of a positive matrix that I gave at the beginning. Is this not going to be a positive matrix? Every entry has to be not just greater than or equal to 0 but greater than 0 because we have said everyone depends on everybody else. So none of these entries can be 0. So we are essentially then faced with the task of solving this equation for a positive matrix, which sort of piques our interest in what sort of eigenvalues can they have? Because this tells us apparently that this condition can be met if this matrix L has an eigenvalue equal to 1, right? And it's a positive matrix. 
So I have kind of introduced this model. We will revisit this again towards the end of this lecture. But before that, we will have to develop a bit more uh, sort of tools around it, particularly delve into positive matrices. I will not be able to prove every one of them. As I said, Peron Frobenius theory or the theory of positive matrices is quite detailed. So I have it all jotted down, but uh, maybe we will not have time for all of those proofs. But I will nonetheless give you the main results so that you can just see how this problem can be solved. Okay? Or how we can talk about when this problem is in fact solvable. Okay? So we will get back to this Leontief's model again towards the end of this lecture. But before that, a bit of groundwork needs to be done. So in general, let me just talk about norms of vectors and matrices again. These may not, need not be norms induced by inner products, general norm. So if you have, for example, a vector like so, then we say that the pth norm of this vector is given by summation of the absolute values of or the moduli of the individual components raised to the power p, yeah, then the pth root thereof. This is a general norm, okay. Interestingly, as you let limit p tend to infinity, what do you think is this going to turn out to be? Any guesses? Yeah, why? Is it obvious? So how do we prove this? So, I mean, it's not that difficult. It's after all a finite sum. So this is moduli x1 plus moduli x2 plus moduli xn, right? So of course, there's at least a maxima among these fellows. One of these fellows at least, maybe multiple fellows are equal to that maxima, but at least one of these fellows corresponds to the maxima, right? So let's pull that out of here. So this all raised to the power p and then the pth root, right? So let's say I pick out one of these largest fellows, one of these fellows as the largest. Let's call that m, all right? Then what happens to the rest? Isn't it you agree? Just dividing it out by the largest, right? Taking its raising it to the pth power and taking its pth root just pulls out this. What do you know about each of these? So of course, remember that p tends to infinity. At most, these fellows can be unity at those locations which correspond to the maximum value. All the others will go to 0 as p tends to infinity because these are all smaller than unity magnitude wise. So what happens to those fellows that go to unity? When unity is raised to the pth power, it's still unity. So you multiply them, let's say k of them are equal to unity. So it's just k raised to the 1 by p, but p tends to infinity. So k raised to 0, that's again unity. So it is equal to indeed m, which is to say that if you look at the infinity norm of a, of a vector, of an n tuple of numbers, it is just the absolute value of the largest, or the largest absolute value among all of those fellows, right? Magnitude wise, whichever is the largest, you pick that fellow out. Yeah, so that's one. Uh, now, if you want to define by the same token for a matrix A, that is M cross N, and you want to define its infinity norm. Now, this is an induced norm, not something that you get from an inner product like a Frobenius norm. So again, you'll have to say that I'm going to search for, okay, this. Now this is defined, see? See every time you put something on the left, the things that you use to define that thing on the left, on the right, the things on the right must be well defined. The thing on the right is well defined here. Is it not? So the thing on the right, because this is after all a vector, some y, this is also a vector. So this is an m tuple, this is an n tuple, right? So at least this fellow is defined. Now, what do we need? Can we not just say that look, 
instead of searching for all possible x's, let me just search over all those x's. So this is, of course, we say the maxima over x infinity not equal to 0, but that is also the maxima over a x infinity such that, uh, okay, let us just call it 1, shall we? Because then we can get rid of this. Yeah. Now what happens? Think about entries in this. These are what? If you look at this numerator fellow, it is just something that is going to look like summation a1 j x j 2 j x j until summation a n j. Oh, sorry, it was m, right? Yeah, x j, right? So we are basically trying to look for the maximum of these fellows. So one of these m tuples is going to correspond to the maximum, right? So let us consider that fellow to be summation a k j x j. Suppose this is the max. So corresponding to k, there could be multiple, but let us just take one of them. One of these entries is going to correspond to the maximum and that is going to be pulled out here, is the max. So this fellow, what can you say? How can you bound this fellow? Can I not say that summation a k j x j is less than or equal to summation a k j x j? Sorry, I should pull out the summation here, right? Yeah? This is true. Yeah? just kind of triangle inequality with the with the absolute value operator right now suppose i were to pull out the maximum row sum this is less than or equal to the max row sum of mod a. When I say mod a, I mean the absolute values of the entries, okay? Just an abuse of notation. We will use this very frequently today. So, times xj, but this inequality, is it always going to be an inequality? I am allowed to choose for these xj's such that the maximum value of any x component is unity or minus unity. So suppose whenever an entry of this akj is equal to positive, some positive number, I choose that xj to be plus 1. Whenever it is negative, I choose it to be minus 1. In that sense, will this not then equal summation akj? Right? So that is exactly what this norm is going to be. If you think about it in the generic sense, if you look at the vector, you are looking for the maximum entry. If you are looking for the matrix, you are looking at the maximum sum of the absolute rows or maximum row sum, the absolute row sum. Yeah. Take each individual entry of the in that row, take its absolute value, take its sum. The maximum that any particular row can correspond to, that is going to be the infinity norm. Okay, because this inequality can be satisfied and made into an inequality. So that is exactly how it is defined because this is your best possible choice. That is how you can maximize it. Look, you are trying to maximize this, no? If you are trying to maximize this, then this is your best bet. You cannot make any of those xj's to be more than one. So even if you have an akj which is very large and you want to give it a very high weight, the maximum you can give is one because the xj's are restricted by one. So, whenever the AKJs are positive, you give them a weight of plus 1. Whenever the AKJs are negative, you give them a weight of minus 1 and that is how you can maximize this sum. 
through any choice of xj x that you can choose that is the only way for you that's the best trick for you to maximize this and therefore that maximum sum will correspond to the max row sum right so indeed the infinity norm of a vector is its highest entry the infinity norm of a matrix is going to turn out to be the sum of the absolute values of the rows and then you look at the maximum of those row sums right so these two important notions are clear this this is true for any generic matrix we have not even gone into uh, positive matrices yet you agree that this is the best choice of x that we can make in order to maximize this right yeah all right so now we are going to look at specifically positive matrices and see how where all this is leading us to okay so before going into that another general notion that we have to describe is so called spectral radius of a matrix okay yes it is about eigen values but it may not be an eigen value in itself so the spectral radius of a is defined as uh say the absolute value of z such that z is an eigen value of a you see why z need not i mean why the spectral radius need not be an eigen value in itself because the spectral radius is always going to be a real number it's a radius as the term suggests but your eigen value with the largest absolute value need not be a real number it can be a complex number positive. yeah definitely radius has to be a positive number so this is the absolute value so spectral radius in itself may not be a complex number however it turns out that for positive matrices and this is why positive matrices the theory is beautiful because it turns out that with positive matrices we can do everything that we do with positive numbers the arithmetic is that simple the analysis isn't which is why it's going to take us a while to get there but the arithmetic is very simple you multiply something with a positive number if you have an inequality multiply both sides of the inequality with a positive number it remains invariant the inequality sign doesn't flip and the several other important analogies that you will see that carry for positive numbers also holds for positive matrices okay it will turn out that for a positive matrix the spectral radius is going to be exactly the eigen value and i said the eigen value which means that no other eigen value can have exactly the same magnitude as the eigen value corresponding to the spectral radius which means if you look at the complex plane yeah and you draw a circle of radius equal to r a you are only going to have one of these eigen values sitting here for a positive matrix and there can be no other eigen value anywhere on this circle yeah everything is going to be contained inside it why inside because of course by definition this is oh i didn't write the most important thing right this is the max yeah so i i should write the yeah so this is the largest that's why is the spectral radius everything is contained inside it yeah so there's exactly one at the periphery here there can be no other at this periphery what is even more interesting as we shall see hopefully if we have time is the fact that even this fellow has an al algebraic multiplicity equal to 1 exactly so it cannot even be repeated <clears throat> all right so the spectral radius for a positive matrix there's a unique largest real eigen value so when i say spectral radius that's also an eigen value it's real of course it's non repeating so it has a geometric multiplicity equal to the algebraic multiplicity is equal to 1 right so these are all properties of positive matrices we shall see how far we can get with those some of those proofs and those explanations uh, but again if even if we don't get there i'll at least ask you to remember this much because this is what is going to be very useful for us in our uh, leontief's model that we've introduced earlier okay so once we have defined the spectral radius now uh let's try and see how far we can get with those some of those proofs all right so suppose so 
I'm going to use this notation for a positive matrix now. Okay, suppose A, did I use this for positive definite? Okay, then I'm just going to use the simple notation. Is a positive matrix. Okay, and V is a non negative vector not equal to 0. Then what can you say about AV? What can you say about AV? Just think a bit. I'm saying AV has to be positive, cannot even be 0 at any entry. V is has at least one non-negative uh, at non-zero entry because it's not otherwise it would have been zero. If it has any non-zero entry that must be positive. So V is a vector, right? V is a vector, A is a matrix. A has all its entries positive. V can have at most zero entries but no negative entries certainly. Now if you hit V with A, in one go all of those entries of AV must be positive. I mean, even if you have one of those as non-zero, it's just going to—it's just going to pick out that particular column of A and scale it by some factor. So therefore, this is really going to be very straightforward, right? I'm not even worthy of writing a proof here, but I hope that you are convinced that this is true. So, if provided A is positive, I mean, and V is non-negative, then of course AV must be positive, right? That is—that is a given. What about a second property? Suppose u1 is greater than u2. Again, I'm dealing with them like they're numbers, but that's because precisely they are almost. u1 and u2 are vectors. When I say u1 and u2 have this relation, it means that every entry of u1 is greater than every entry of u2. So that u1 minus u2 is a positive vector. Yeah, this essentially means and is meant by u1 minus u2 being a positive vector. Now, if you let A, sorry? Yes, C1 and U2 are vectors. Now, let A be a positive matrix, then we have AU1 is greater than AU2. What do I need to prove this? I need to just show that A acting on U1 minus U2 is positive, but that's already done. If U1 minus U2 is a positive vector, then A acting on U1 minus U2 must also be a positive vector. Therefore, A U1 must be greater than A U2 in the sense of the vector like you compare n tuples entry wise. So every comparison here is entry wise. So you see how they are exactly similar to the arithmetic we do with, with numbers. No different. Yeah, only thing you have to sort of imagine the operations a bit in your head and you will arrive at these conclusions. Most of these early parts of the proofs, they will not require too much. Okay. Now the one proof that we are going to see and conclude this module with is the following. So suppose V is a positive vector. So from the shorthand notation, I'm not being very technical here because we don't have the time for all those technically detailed writing up of this, yeah? So suppose we have this and uh, let A V be greater than V, which is to say that whenever A acts on V, it generates a new vector. Yeah, so A is a square matrix, of course, square positive matrix, like we have in the Leontief's model. Otherwise, you cannot compare. So whenever A acts on V, it generates a new vector, each of which whose entries are greater than that of V. Yeah. Then we have that A to the K v is also going to be greater than v. Is this, is this obvious? Yeah? Why? Yeah, but how do you prove this? Keep applying A on both sides. Then? But the first time you apply A, you are only comparing A, V. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically just keep arguing 
that if you hit, it, hit this fellow with A on both sides now, right? Then this is greater than AV. But AV is greater than this. But what do you have then? You have A squared V is greater than AV. Yeah, which is greater than V. Right? If, in fact, if you want to see it in a little more elegant fashion, you can just say that, well, uh, I mean, what I have A acting on AV minus V is also going to be greater than 0, right? Yeah, so therefore, A squared V minus V minus AV plus AV minus V is greater than 0. Because this is one positive vector, this is another positive vector. Yeah? So therefore, A squared V minus V is greater than 0. So this is the base step of the induction, if you like. Assume it to be true for A to the L V minus V greater than 0. And then hit it with A again. So A to the L V minus V greater than 0, which means A to the L plus 1 V minus A V, again plus A V minus V greater than 0. This is a positive vector. This is a positive vector. Sum of two positive vectors has to be positive vector. Therefore, A to the L plus 1 V is greater than V. I mean, whichever way you like. You like stacking them up, that's it. You like to do a bit of induction. That's also true, right? So these are some interesting properties. So you see already, you, I, I hope you can begin to see the, the analogy between operating on a vector, particularly if the vector is positive, with positive matrices to what you do when you operate on a positive number by multiplying it with another positive number, insofar as inequalities are concerned. And these are going to have very interesting and grave consequences, as we shall see shortly in the next module.